we're going to talk a little bit about the behaviorist theory of second language acquisition. And first, in order to understand this theory, we have to take a little detour and check out the underlying theory, which originally didn't have much to do with language at all. I'm talking about behavioral psychology. The idea that all actions, whether by man or animal, are all learned behaviors and can be learned and unlearned. So the first thing a lot of people think about when they hear behavioral psychology is Pavlov's dogs. If you've ever taken an intro to psychology class, you'll probably remember that Pavlov was the guy who rang a bell every time he fed his dogs, and eventually the dogs learned to associate the sound of the bell with food. And as a result, they salivated every time the bell rang, whether there was food or not. In a nutshell, Pavlov discovered a process in which a previously neutral stimulus came to evoke a specific response by being repeatedly paired with another stimulus that evoked the response. And psychologists came to call this classical conditioning. So psychologists eventually expanded on Pavlov's findings, and the result was a new type of conditioning called operant conditioning, a theory that's usually attributed to an American psychologist named Skinner. If a reward or reinforcement follows the response to a stimulus, then the response becomes more likely in the future. Makes sense, right? So what does all this have to do with second language acquisition? Well, in the 50s and 60s, it became popular to apply behavioral psychology to all types of learning, including language learning. Two psychologists most known for applying behavioral psychology to learning, and especially language learning, are Watson and the already mentioned Skinner. This application of behavioral psychology to language learning eventually led to the behaviorist theory of second language acquisition. So what exactly is the behaviorist theory of SLA? Or second language acquisition? Well, take a look. The foreign language behavior learner is the organism whose behavior is being conditioned. The behavior is verbal behavior. The stimulus is what is taught or presented of the foreign language. The response is then the learner's reaction to the stimulus. And the reinforcement is the approval and praise of the teacher and fellow students, as well as self-satisfaction. Language mastery is represented as acquiring a set of appropriate language stimulus response chains. So with this in mind, we can take a brief look at audio lingualism, which is the teaching method that originated from the behaviors theory and focused on language learning as mere habit formation. So, because behaviorists and supporters of audiolingualism viewed language learning as habit formation, dialogues and drills formed the basis of learning. Dialogues were used for repetition and memorization, correct pronunciation, stress, rhythm, and intonation are emphasized. Furthermore, one of the results of treating learning as behavior was that meaning was excluded from consideration, especially during the early stages. Because the focus was on forming a habit, it really wasn't important for a foreign language learner to know what he or she was saying, just that it was being said correctly. And in the beginning stages of learning via audiolingualism, the focus was on oral language. Written language wasn't introduced until more advanced stages of learning, because it was thought to interfere with habit formation. Also, error prevention and error correction was heavily emphasized. In accordance with operant conditioning from behavioral psychology, correct responses should receive positive reinforcement, and negative responses received negative reinforcement, thereby encouraging the desired behavior. So, audiolingualism reached its peak in the 1960s, when it was widely used in classrooms across the U.S. in the teaching of foreign languages, as well as the teaching of English as a second language. But the popularity of the theory didn't last for long. Results fell short of expectations, and students were unable to transfer skills to real communication outside the classroom. Plus, many students found the drilling, memorization, and repetition to be, quite frankly, boring. Also, in the late 1960s, linguistic theory began to take a different direction. Part of the reason for this is MIT linguist Noam Chomsky's rejection of the behaviorist theory of language learning. Language is not a habit structure, Chomsky said, 
ordinary linguistic behavior characteristically involves innovation, formation of new sentences and patterns in accordance with rules of great abstractness and intricacy. Chomsky argued that much of human language use is not imitated behavior. Instead, it's created from underlying knowledge of abstract rules. Even though the use of audiolingualism has declined drastically since the 60s, the basic premise of the behaviors theory continues to influence many teachers' thinking about how a second language is learned. In fact, even if you didn't go to school back in the 50s and 60s, you can probably still remember some teaching strategies that your classroom teacher might have used, like dialogue, repetition, and drilling, that can be traced back to the behaviors theory. So, in conclusion, language learning for the behaviorists is a matter of conditioning by means of imitation, reinforcement, and habit forming. And although this theory has its shortcomings, it has some merits as well, and still influences the teaching of second languages in some ways, though certainly not to the extent that it did when it was first introduced.